I've always liked walking on the, the hills and the fells and everything. It takes me back to long distance walking, fell walking, walking in Bavaria, skiing in Bavaria when I lived in Germany. And that was in 1933, 34, before I got into the film industry. It's funny how one starts thinking about things like that. They're now making a film about me. And this is the letter that I wrote to Carl Foreman in November 1958. Carl Foreman was already well known as a writer and a producer and director. He was the writer on Bridge of the River Kwai, and I, I think he obviously circulated in the same sort of film circles as I was able to. I said, Dear Mr Foreman, here are the details which I promised to send you after our meeting last Monday. In 1935, I joined London Film Productions as interpreter for a German cameraman. During the next five years, I worked through various secretarial jobs to continuity. I've often been asked, how did you get into the film industry? And when I start to explain, it sounds so improbable nowadays, that having started to think about it, I, I was so incredibly lucky that things just sort of came at me. I'd always been interested in photography. I was given a box brownie when I was about seven, I think, because I have a photograph of my grandparents sitting on the beach at Yarmouth. Well, it started in Berlin, but I didn't know it was going to be an involvement with the film industry, because at that time I wanted to be an actress. And I was very active in a local amateur dramatic group um, in the British community that put on a very serious play with a semi-professional producer every year. But I knew that it wasn't going to lead me anywhere in Germany because, as a foreigner, I wouldn't be able to get a work permit. That was made quite clear to me. But um, some of my newly made acquaintances who worked in the film industry told me about a film congress that was being organised under the auspices of Dr Goebbels and they suggested that I and my American girlfriend should go and apply for jobs as receptionists because we spoke several languages and it would be useful. So we did, and we both got taken on. And that was at the Berlin International Film Congress from April the 25th to May the 1st in 1935. But when I went back to London a few weeks later, I got in touch with the people that I'd met and said, can I come and see you? And they were all very, very helpful. Unfortunately, the first question they all asked was, well, what experience have you had? And of course, I hadn't had any at all. So they said, well, when you've got some experience, come back and talk to us again. My father and mother were on holiday in Cornwall, and I joined them. And after I'd been there for a couple of weeks, I got a... I think it must have been a telegram. It wouldn't have been a phone call saying, would I ring up London Film Productions, Mr Cunningham, at Wharton Hall Studios, because they probably had a job that I could do. They were shooting a film called Conquest of the Air, and the cameraman was a German cameraman called Hans Schneeberger, and that's what they wanted me to do, interpret for, for Schneeberger. And the first day shooting in the studio, the star of that day was a very young Laurence Olivia, very dramatic, playing a balloonist called Lunardi. And um, it was a disaster because although I could speak very good German, I'd never been in a film studio. I hadn't a clue what all the film terms were. Fortunately, the focus puller was half German and he could do the job that I'd been taken on to do admirably. But Alex Corder didn't sack me, put me into the publicity department. Alex, when I first started there, was setting up 
what turned out to be one of the, the best special effects departments that had ever existed. He brought over Ned Mann from the States and they were making fantastic films by present, the, the standards of the time. Um, things to come and the man who could work miracles and they liked to explain to you what they were doing so you could go and watch them and see the wheels go around. And I used to spend all the time I could on the set, of course, watching them shooting. By then I was absolutely hooked. I continued learning about how films were made. And by 1938, I'd got to the state where I'd worked as an assistant continuity girl and um, done continuity on a couple of small films. And um, I got home one day and my mother said that there'd been a phone call from a man called Baxter who wanted me to go and do an all-night script session at Pinewood. Anthony Hadlock Allen was the producer. Michael Redgrave was going to star together with Valerie Hobson. We had the all-night script conference, which was very alarming. It was full of funny names like Dragish Abata, Freakoff and Zonaman. And um, I didn't know which were people and which were places. Anyway, I made notes, typed it out, full report of what people had said, what their opinions were and what they were going to do to alter the provisional script that had been written. And um, took it down to the studio. Mr Baxter looked at it and said, that looks all right, fine. I'll let you know if there's anything else. So I went home, got a phone call later, saying that they were very pleased with the report and would I like to come and work on the film? And I said, what as? And they said, well, uh, production secretary. That, of course, was a job that I hadn't done, really, but I thought I might as well have a go. So I said yes. So this Mr Baxter was the production manager. I became his production secretary. In due course, he directed the second unit shooting in London and I was continuing to go on the second unit, and we got on very well together. At the end of the production, we said goodbye, and we'll see you again. And we did see each other again, quite often, obviously, because by the time the war started, we decided we were going to get married. Rod had started when he came down from Oxford as a trainee at Gaumont British. The first picture he worked on was Jules Seuss with Conrad Veidt. And he became hooked on films. During that time, uh, I was asked if I would like to join the Film Trade Union, which was the Association of Cine Technicians, which had only started a few years before. And I said, yes, please. And my membership, original membership number was 145, and I was their first woman member. In 1940, I transferred to documentary film production with the Shell Film Unit. I went to the Shell Film Unit as a production assistant, which meant a general dog's body. And the first film I worked on was about transfer of skill, which was skilled craftsmen using those skills for wartime production. Like a number of ordinary handy people in Britain, Mr. Krebin became skilled at his chosen craft of model engineering. Shell, during the war, in peacetime, said like to the government, watches. you may use our film unit the the for shop, any purpose that you need. And transfer of skill was for use by the Ministry of Information to explain why people are being taken away from jobs like making jewellery, to use similar skills in making bits of machinery for weapons and, and so forth. In war, small timepieces are still wanted, but they are called fuses. They go, not in a man's waistcoat pocket, but in the nose of an anti-aircraft shell. I was told to go to de Havilland's and make a film about teaching an apprentice to file metal. Filing is quite an intricate thing, according to what sort of metal you're filing and what you want it to end up as. And that's what we made an, an eight-minute film about. Filing is a method of smoothing material or shaping it to exact dimensions. And because I had these bad habits learned in feature films, 
the camera moved occasionally instead of just showing things statically. Press the handle of the file firmly into the palm of your hand. Your thumb should be on top. Like this, you have firm control of the file. John Grissom had started what was known as British Documentary. All the most interesting people were very political at the time when I started. We all of us had some association with Film Centre because they were the instrument between us and the government organisations. And they could allocate films that were required to members of the documentary group who were most suited to that sort of production. Film Centre had their office in Soho Square at the time, and Edgar Anstey was about the leading producer. And he was a very, very good person because people trusted him, and therefore he fought a lot of battles for documentary. Um, first time I saw you, Kay, uh, is a uh, uh, very vivid memory because I'd been to the little Southern Railway film unit, you know, for a year, and then we we, we joined up with the, with Edgar's lot. The transport films. Yes. Uh huh. I came to work one day, and there was a, there was a Packard shooting break parked outside, yes. which, I, which was a, I hadn't seen before. So I get upstairs. I walk into the production office, and I was used to documentary people who uh, wore very baggy corduroy trousers, check flannel shirts tweed jackets with a leather band round the cuffs and something on the elbows and that. And what they had a liquid lunch every day, which was <laughs> awful. And uh, standing there were two people from another world. And uh, you were the most striking woman that I had seen. Oh, sir. No, true. I mean, <laughs> look, provincial boy from Margate, dear, and then in the army. You know. And, um, and uh, there was Rod uh, wearing a beautifully cut blazer, a canary yellow cashmere cardigan. Yes. And a, and a silk scarf. <laughs> that sounds exactly like Rod. My, my husband was a remarkable gentleman, actually. Glad yeah. you worked with him. I mean, the thing that I found about Rod, he was a meticulous researcher. Yes. And he was a marvellous, <laughs> he was a marvellous assistant director. They had a lovely relationship, I thought. Um, uh, it was, uh, they would argue. Well, I, <laughs> no, I, it, it was. It wasn't an argument. It was a. It was a. It was a sort of An exchange of contrary views. <laughs> Lovely, beautifully put. I was going to say a cross between an argument and a debate, <laughs> <laughs> which is the same thing. I directed two instructional films for Shell's own use, followed by two for the National Fire Service and one for Civil Defence. We had a lot of little individual fire services all over the country when the Blitz really started on London. And the National Fire Service brought everybody together. They all had to communicate with each other because there were reserves of appliances and men in different parts of the country and not necessarily where they were needed. And this meant that they wanted a uniform working method, hence the purpose of this film. 10 y 3 Where's the job? These people were all fully trained fire service personnel and they were merely doing what they had learned to do and what they were trying to tell other people throughout the country to do in the future. My problem was to find camera positions that would show the things that we were trying to teach clearly, um, that would keep the action flowing would let people know what they were supposed to be concentrating on at any time. And it's not a very filmic subject, let's face it. My problem in all these early films that I was making was I wanted to make films. From 1943 to 1949, I worked with Paul Rother Productions, the Realist Film Unit and Basic Films, writing, directing and editing films for various government departments, and for private sponsors. This was kind of like a, a maturing of Kay's film style, because previous to that you've been doing 
pretty much purely instructional kind of thing. Well, that's why I wanted to leave the shelf room unit. Because it was see, too, too, it was too, mechanical, too, yeah. too, too technical and everything, and I wanted people. So this is like a proper narrative. You've got a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there's a story going on. Good afternoon, nurse. I brought Dr. Wright with me. How do you do? Good afternoon, doctor. And how's the patient? Oh, she's had a restless night, but she's a bit easier today. Mm. She's been fretting herself about Dr. Wright here, coming all that way from Inverness. This was another one that was for non-theatrical distribution. Oh, right so it would be shown by any of the people who got their films on their subjects through the Ministry of Information. And it was a softener up for the publicity that would ensue when the beverage report emerged, I believe. Because Scotland had a medical service from 1892 onwards. The, the problem was that there was really no consensus about the welfare state. I mean, the belief is now that between 39 and 45, everyone got together and decided, yes, we must build, rebuild Britain with a national health service. <laughs> but that wasn't the case at all, because there was a large phalanx of people on the right who really didn't believe the state should pay for things like health care. And there was vested interest. The BMA was dead against any nationalised health system, a free health system. Um, but there were people in favour of it who realised that really the best way to deal with it would be some kind of a health system. But there was great division about this. And so there really is no film made, apart from this one that I can think of, that addresses the idea of a national health service. You know, I'm an Edinburgh man, but even so, the Highlands and Islands medical scheme wasn't much more than a name to me. Well, now that you've seen it working, what do you think of it? Seems to me there's a great future for subsidised medical services like this one. Well, take today. Mrs. MacDonald gets your services, a specialist, and an air ambulance to take her 200 miles to hospital. In fact, she's just as well off as a patient in town who has everything on her doorstep. It was a different story when I came here first. I, I over 30 years ago. The, the gentleman who plays the doctor was a school teacher a who had got a certain fame for performances or readings and talks at Cayley's. And this was the first time he appeared in front of a film camera. So, Kay, you were really the British Rossellini then, weren't you? Yeah, true. Yeah, I'd really never thought of that. Yeah, I mean, you true, took true. local people who weren't actors and you made them into actors, which is exactly well, what Rossellini did well, about yes. two years later. The doctor that it was based on was a doctor called McLeod, and all the incidents in this involving the trip to Ben Betula in the horse and carriage. All of those are true stories told to me by Dr. McLeod. There is one doctor out from here who has forged to cross on some visits. If the tide's low enough, he takes a trap. If it's full, he goes by boat. And if it's half in between, well, he just has to sit and wait. We can none of us afford motor cars. It's the same for the district nurses. Is this our, is this our cameo? Is that you? Yeah. Travel by bus <laughs> and walk. We don't but get a close-up so though. No. And they just Why can't do you think get around the do it? <laughs> and if we have trouble in reaching our patients... In 1988, I came up to Scotland, to this area for the first time. And I came up several times after that. And eventually I bought myself a static caravan on a farm outside Shore Head. Moved up permanently in 1996. And I've lived up here ever since. And I just became absolutely absorbed with the whole area. It is so beautiful. One moment it's very, very wooded, the next moment it's a vast expanse of fields. And always this wonderful sky, which is sheer delight. Humphreys and Galloway. The documentary community was full of lovely people. You didn't meet them necessarily when you were working, but you nearly always met them when you finished work. You tramped across Soho Square to one of your favourite pubs. The, the one that's now called the Nelly Dean was the Highlander. And that was the, the one that we most of us used to go to, because it was easy to get to. There were Bill and Ethel behind the bar, and they were very, very sweet and helpful and nice. 
and we played Shove Hapney and you met the people from the union. And it was a general mixture of people mm. who'd all spent mm. their time, mm. a day's work mm -hmm. in the film industry mm. and liked talking about films. Mm. But in, on top of that, we had as regular visitors people like Lucian Freud, Dylan Thomas. No. Oh, yes. Dylan was a. Fr when he was in London, he was often the Highlander. <laughs> I think I, I was lucky to work in documentaries as I sometimes dream about working uh, with my colleagues, you know. Deborah Tunneling was 42, Minister of Information. It was a or, Minister of Information film, but it was a Heavy Rescue. Yes, and it must have been a teaching film for it, other rescuers. It was, yes. indeed. Uh, because they, they devised this system of tunneling under the rubble, that's right. Because under the rubble, although you couldn't see it, there might have been walls that had collapsed and left you with a sort of void underneath. The debris tunnelers had a practicing ground, I remember. Just outside Steventon, I think it was. The, and, yes. And that's where we went to uh, the training press. We worked at the edge of collapsed buildings and uh, we could arrange beams and the tunnelers arranged the tunnel for us. The difficulty was to get a lens wide enough to film in the tunnel and there was only one camera we had, the Newman Sinclair, and the widest lens was uh, 25, I believe. It's true, I mean, we were very limited as far as um, wide angle. Altogether, equipment was primitive in those days. It was clockwork cameras. Of course, to get light into a tunnel wasn't easy. Uh, we only had photo floods, and I don't know whether we used any, maybe a reflector to get some light into it. But uh, it wasn't much more difficult than any other. In film, every setup is a new problem. Bombs have destroyed hundreds of thousands of buildings in our cities and damaged many more. Since 1939, nothing has been built that was not needed directly for war. When we made New, new Builders, of course, that was a, a film for the Apprenticeship and Training Council of the Ministry of Works. And they wanted to have a film to show to schools that they would get boys to go either to building school when they left school at 14, then go into apprenticeship in the building trades. All over the country, schools of a secondary type are being opened to train boys of 13 and 14 who want to become builders. Well, in my work, I usually didn't have a conscious approach to the look of things. I just made the best of what I found. Our time was very limited, usually. Our budgets were very limited because documentary films didn't earn any money in the box office. We learned the use of the trial, straight edge, plumb rule, spirit level, square, and many other tools. So much of it was shot in the school for builders. But we did go on location to actual building work being done. That's right, we went down, we stayed in South Sea, that was it. And the only active work they could find for us was building cottages for farm workers, because that was regarded as something that was going to be necessary as soon as the war was over, because food supplies and all the rest of it would not be very good. And we had these pairs of farm cottages that were wonderful. They were under our control, more or less. From, from the actual finding of the site, building foundations and everything. We clambered about all over the place, didn't we? Yes, indeed, on the roof <laughs> and everywhere. <laughs> Kay, having been a, an editor, edited the film in the camera almost, and she knew what she wanted, which is always so good for the cameraman because nothing is worse than a director who doesn't know what he wants. Thank you. 
Oh, she. Sorry. <laughs> Over the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still. Basic Films was the company that um, my husband and I set up in 1945. Because Basic was at 18, the Soho Square. First of all, we had one floor at 18, and then we had a second floor at 18. And the first film we made at that company was made for the Daily Herald and was for the 1945 election propaganda for the Labour Party. There was a massive job that was required at the end of the War of Reconstruction. And as Kay's film shows, this, it wasn't just the people of the poorest part of society who were living in, in poor housing people who were, if you like, the sort of ordinary working class. Uh, and and, and other, other people were living in housing which you just couldn't live effectively in. Just ordinary household management of their family and their life. And it was mainly women at this stage. It was just difficult for them and made their already physically difficult job that much more arduous. The largest group of workers in Britain are the housewives. Their workshop is the home. Their daily job, looking after their families. To some people, the housing problem is a headline in a newspaper. But millions of women throughout the length and breadth of the country can speak of it from their own experience. Listen to some of them. There was a belief that you needed to involve people in the planning process. You needed to get them discussing with planners and architects and local politicians actually what they wanted. And film was regarded as a great medium to involve all group people. It was the most popular form of entertainment. So film was regarded as a great tool by the government and lots of other people. And up there at the window is Mrs. Tasker. She pays nine and fourpence a week for her flat. As I looked at a period of your films from 1940 through to the end of the war, you were first sort of starting out being quite functional and practical in the way that you were shooting things and you became a lot more sophisticated as you went along in the war. The water's on the landing. That's our scullery, really, because there's two or three other tenants use it beside us, mm -hmm. and the WC's out there. But the water's cold. There's no hot water at all. I if don't like continuous water, talking to the camera, so I devised, having been a continuity girl for a brief time, I devised an idea where I could use sections of interview and make them seem as though they were consecutive, because the woman would be doing something that enabled me to do a cutaway of that action. Well, I don't know whether they call it a kitchen or what they call it. I call it a muck up. We have to live, wash, cook, feed, and, and say everything all under one in this room. But sometimes I, I would really like to meet the man that designed the house. And what I would do with him, well, I'd put him in here on a wet washing day when the children are home from school and then he'd go on with it. I was I sitting just under the camera. Done. So that eye line was almost to the camera. It's quite important to um, realise, for, for a television audience today familiar with face-to-camera interviews, this was a revolutionary technique, and, and it's also very important politically because it instantly gives dignity to the, to the interviewee, and particularly when you also give them the name, which is what you did with all of these people, you identified them. This is no longer an anonymous slum dweller or member of the working class. This is an individual. And when somebody looks at you and they give you their name, you're immediately forcing the member of the audience to treat them with respect. Nobody had really thought about interior house design. So when I was making this film, it was much more a sort of political thing that the women ought to have a say, coming from a general political conviction, rather than from the actual conditions they were living under. The laboratory is outside. And it is a bucket lavatory and has to be emptied very often, which is a very nasty job. And you have to dig a big hole in the garden and, uh, oh dear, it's awful, you know. Well, one review said that um, the women were whining and monotonous um, and that the film could have done with an injection of humour. Um, which I thought was quite patronising, but it also said that it was um, a good film and it should um, be a good encouragement and aid to um, looking at the problem of housing in the 1940s. In 1949, one of my films, La Famille Martin, 
gained the British Film Academy Award for Specialised Films. This was a two-reeler for the Ministry of Education to help French teaching in schools. Mesdemoiselles, Messieurs, je vous présente Monsieur André Martin. There was the instructional film, yes. Um, and there was this kind of travel, travel old film, you know. And, but there was the, then what I think were called the prestige films, like um, what was the one I did about Tudor England, the England of Elizabeth. Oh yes. Um, my first job as a cameraman. As a, as, no, as an assistant. As an assistant. It was yeah. on a picture about um, country houses in the in in the home counties, which was directed by Michael Clarke. Mm -hmm. Photographed by another Michael Cara Briggs. Michael had just come off a picture and he said, Oh, he said, I've been working with this Virago. Oh, I beg your pardon. Well, you don't think he's referring to me? I, I do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been called a monster. <laughs> no, I've not been called a better. Virago. <laughs> Were you in the Crown film yet? No, I, I never aspired to Crown. I think they didn't care for me very much. As you say, they, I probably had the reputation of being a Virago or a monster or something. Well, if you weren't a Crown, you probably wouldn't have known Jennings, did you? Oh, I only sat in his lap at all the end of picture parties. What was he like? He was a... He was a spellbinder. I'm sure. Um, when I was going to make the first French film, La Feminata, um, I stayed at the small hotel in the Rue Jacob. And to my surprise, when I arrived one day, I found Humphrey in the hotel. And he took me to dinner at La Perouse. And we walked back along the river bank. And it was a lovely, lovely spring Paris night. And we stopped and leaned over the wall and looked at the river. And Humphrey just talked about this, that, and everything else. Like he, the thing about Humphrey was that he was so widely read, mm. had so many interests. What year was that? Forty-nine. Just before he died. Just before. Well, I was on that. I was working on on one of those films when he died. No, yeah. Um, it was the, the change of face of Europe. Mm. And I went in to, to ring up for a Russia's report. And I didn't get a Russia's report. I was told that Humphrey had died in an accident on, on his location. It was really very, it was what the worst possible thing. You see, because I think that if he'd lived, I, I like to think that I could have worked with him. Oh, gosh, yes. I think he was probably exasperating when he was working. I don't know. But you know, I've, everybody said this. Uh, but, you know, all my life, uh, you know, whether it's been working with Ken Russell or Barbara yeah, Ken Streisand. Ken Russell, yes, go you on. Know, people say, oh, you're going to have a dreadful time, yes. they're murdered, they're, they're great. Because well, they I, don't suffer fools gladly, that's why, no, neither I, do I. This is my, my silly gag. That I, I used to go specially to find people like that. Yeah. And that was how I got to work with Ken Russell. I did yeah. two pictures with him. He was yeah. an absolute pussycat. From 1951 to 1955, I lived in Java working intermittently in association with the technicians of the local government film service and also shooting background material for companies in Britain. One of the films I made during this period was Mardi and the Monkey, a two-reeler for the Children's Film Foundation. Mary Field wanted a story about the country and the people, to show what Indonesia was like, for her Saturday morning clubs. Mardi calls the monkey Manis, which means good but she doesn't live up to her name. When the film was over, the monkey came and lived with us and lived in a tree in our compound and used to come out in the car. It liked sitting on my lap and playing with the steering wheel while I was driving. And I'd been driving around all over the place and I found this fishing village and desperately wanted to make a film about the boats because at the end of the war the Japanese paid some reparations to the Javanese for what had gone on during the occupation period and they presented them with some new motorized fishing boats and th they, there was a training scheme for the younger men to learn the technicalities of the motorboat and that's what this film is about. So at last, Dapod went fishing on the new boat. Oh, 
when I'd been in Indonesia for a couple of three years, I was offered a job to go up to the Malayan Film Unit, which of course was still a protectorate at the time. I would love to have gone. I said, yes, please. And I got a letter saying the job was no longer available. So congratulations on being on McCarthy's blacklist. <laughs> I'd still like to know who gave our names to somebody. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't illegal to be a communist during the war, and I was a member of the Communist Party because I was interested in what they believed in. It was just another angle on what was going on in the world around us. I, I dropped my party membership before we went to Indonesia because I thought it might be an embarrassment to my husband. He was glad I did. I've been trying to persuade him to get more and more left-wing minded ever since we got married, before we got married. Right, as if I thought he was left-wing enough. He was left-wing enough, but he wouldn't join the party. Oh, I see. He was only uh, um, nicely left-wing. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> when I came back to London early in 1956, the Children's Film Foundation asked me to direct a feature, The Kid from Canada. Since making that film, I have been working as a continuity girl again. Continuity girls don't seem to exist anymore. Uh, they started to go out of fashion when, um, what do you call it? Video assist. Video assist, as it's as if called. As that's all that continuity was about. Yes, yes, but now everybody stands and looks at it and says, oh, yes, I can see what he did, so on, so on, so on, so on. The continuity girl can't even see the, the screen that they're looking at. But when it first started, there was nothing like that. And the continuity girl was the only person who knew each day what was happening. In other words, it wasn't just a question of whether somebody got the right hat on or the right tie. It was knowing where you were in the story, where you were in the script, what the camera had been doing in the past, and she timed the script. Mm. When the picture started, she also had to type continuity sheets, which were full scat pages, mm -hmm. so at least one for each setup. Mm -hmm. The longest day, the longest day's work on it was yours, always your job. There was always about two hours the work at the end of the, the day, end, yes. Yeah. And what typing? The films that I remember with greatest pleasure were From Russia with Love, with Terence Young. So we went to Istanbul and went up and down the Bosphorus on a boat. I worked with Vincent Minnelli on The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, um, The Heroes of Telemark, on location with Kirk Douglas. He was a great man. I, I'm, I'm very proud to have worked with Kirk. Fahrenheit 451 was full of extraordinary things from the point of view of anybody doing continuity, because Truffaut was most imaginative and of course one of the things in Fahrenheit is that it's about the burning of the books. He wanted certain bits of sentences in the books to burn so he put gel which burns exactly where you put it. Watching him do it was fascinating and trying to find out how one was going to keep track of what he was doing I can't imagine. <laughs> Now I would like to take the step forward that I started to take in 1940. I'm up against two things, that I am a woman and that I am not a prodigy with a name in some other creative field. The fact that my job has been learned thoroughly in all its branches for many years counts little against these handicaps. And I didn't know that there was a disadvantage in being a woman until uh, 1949 and the head of studio that I wanted to go and work at, by name Michael Balkan, said that it was a job that a woman couldn't handle. Lenny Riefenstahl, yeah. <laughs> Lenny Riefenstahl, yes. May I hope that you will consider me as a technician, irrespective of sex, on the evidence of what I have done during the past few years. 
I very much appreciate the time you gave to seeing me and I hope that I shall have a further opportunity of talking with you. Perhaps even of working with you. Yours sincerely, K. Manda. Pity. I never did. My mind always turns to a film construction whenever I see anything that attracts me in depth because I always want to sort of open it up and make it clear to myself and to anybody else who happens to be interested. And there are so many things about this area that I would love to share with other people. I would like them to understand what makes a country like it is, and people like they are, and to enthuse people about things that are worth being enthusiastic about. I personally have had an exceedingly pleasant and unexpectedly entertaining life, and it's due entirely to the, the film people and the people that, through association with them, I have met. Absolutely, my, you must agree entirely. In fact, for me. my thanks are to the film industry. Mm.